Welcome everyone. I'm Zara Toxus, program maker at the Bali, and I organized this evening NATO Under Attack, which is actually a uh, program series supported by uh, NATO. We're very happy of this. And um, I'm just here for some practical notes. Uh, Roberta Haar, the moderator, will take over in a minute. You'll find uh, some cards on your chair, the yellow cards. These are tear in cards. Uh, so you can let us know what you thought of the program after. They're in Dutch, so maybe you yeah, should get some help of your neighbor. And uh, there's a live stream. So uh, yeah, hundreds of Dutchies can watch you, be aware. <laughs> And uh, there's time for questions afterwards. If you have any questions on the setup of the program or uh, on the Bali in general, um, yeah, don't hesitate to ask me. I'll give the floor to Roberta Haar. She is a professor at Maastricht University, Foreign Policy Analysis and Transatlantic Relations. Welcome. Thank you very much. Sarah. Yes, welcome to uh, the Bali. Uh, so tonight, we are the second of the series on NATO under attack, and tonight we're going to talk about hybrid warfare. How do we define hybrid warfare? I looked, and a quick and concise definition is a war fighting strategy that employs conventional military force supported by irregular tactics and cyber warfare tactics. As a scholar of international relations, you just heard that's what I am, one of foreign policy, um, and also very much interested in the particular, the causes of conflict. I can tell you the only part of that definition that I just read to you, the only part that's new to the war fighting is the word cyber. All other parts would be familiar to war strategists like Sun Tzu, who wrote his Art of the Art of War in the 5th century BC, to Clausewitz, all the way to General James Mattis, who's also known as the warrior monk. So the underlying reasoning of the tactics used in hybrid warfare, they are a classic mix of psyops, so psychological operations, mixed with paramilitary special ops, topped off with concrete conventional weapons. And I think NATO has faced these tactics before in different guises. So the question tonight is, why is cyber warfare proving today to be so difficult to counter? I hope that our introductory speaker who I'll introduce in just a moment, and our panelists tonight, when we have our conversation, they will be able to shed some light on this conundrum. So I'd like to welcome Professor Jamie Shea as our speaker. He is a fellow at Friends of Europe in Brussels, a think tank in Brussels. He's a professor of strategy and security at the University of Exeter. To, prior to this, he served as, in NATO as a number of hats, one as a Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. That's a long title. Uh, until he retired last year, uh, September last year. He worked for the Alliance already for 38 years, um, including as a spokesperson during the 1990, 19, 1999 Kosovo War. And here, I think, is where you probably received most worldwide attention during that time, during the NATO bombing campaign. He's a regular writer or lecturer. He's a conference speaker on NATO. In fact, I heard him speak in to, uh, 2014 at the Transatlantic Studies Association conference in Ghent. But he certainly um, has many other, he's involved in contemporary international relations, and we really will welcome and look forward to your introductory remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that fantastic introduction, which says everything important about my life uh, so far except the only thing that really matters, which is that in 1999, the French magazine Elle voted me the sixth sexiest man in the uh, universe. Uh, I know, I know, scandalous uh, that it wasn't number one, but uh, there you go. Uh, I, I'm really pleased to be here. It's my first uh, appearance at the Bali. Uh, hopefully after my performance this evening, it won't be my last. Uh, it's always also great at the beginning of any event to see that there are more people in the audience than on the panel. Uh, in my long NATO career, I've been in the opposite situation uh, many times. So uh, thank you uh, for coming uh, this evening. Um, the, the subject is, is hybrid warfare. Uh, and I know that cyber and artificial intelligence are up there on the screen, but what I thought that I could usefully do uh, in the few minutes that I've been uh, allotted 
um, is to give you a sense of the geopolitical context in, in which cyber becomes important, in which artificial intelligence becomes potentially uh, problematic, uh, and give you a sense of the various sort of ways in which hybrid warfare is manifesting itself as a challenge. And then finally, uh, as long as I haven't sort of dragged me away from the podium uh, by then, uh, give you a sense of the main sort of policy areas that NATO, the EU, if I can use the term Western, uh, simply for shorthand, governments uh, are going down at the moment when they, they try to find a solution. Now, I think the starting point is that for most of the 38 years that I spent at NATO, uh, the job intellectually was relatively easy. Uh, there was sort of one adversary uh, in one particular geographical location uh, and you could spend virtually all of your uh, resources, your intelligence in trying to figure out uh, that adversary uh, and where he was going. Uh, he wasn't really going anywhere, at least as far as European security is concerned, thank God. Uh, and then you could apply all of your various resources. Uh, so if you came into my office uh, during the 38 years, at one stage you'd see a map of the Ford Gap. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was very much the map of the Balkans. Uh, after that, the map of Afghanistan. Uh, and of course today, uh, unfortunately, we're back to uh, Central and Eastern Europe in the wake of Russia's actions in the Crimea. But but the, the thing about this period was that not only did we have the initial sort of struggle, but we built around it in the Alliance a sort of a superstructure of really believing that if we could just solve this particular issue, there would all, at the same time be a new world order. Uh, the, that the solution of that issue would sort of have a knock-on effect on the solution of many other of the world's problems. Uh, for example, you know, 20 years ago, uh, we had the intervention in Kosovo and Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, gave this famous speech in Chicago where he actually said, you know, that uh, the sort of defeating ethnic cleansing in Kosovo would strike a, a, a positive blow for the responsibility to protect, for the prosecution of war crimes, uh, 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 for you know, the idea of a comprehensive approach to rebuilding uh, uh, states. It would act as a deterrent to other potential dictators and so on. So solve this issue here uh, and you make the rest of the world happy. Um, the Washington Post uh, a couple of months ago, or a year ago now really, when Raqqa uh, fell and uh, we were all prematurely proclaiming the end of the ISIS caliphate, had an interesting editorial and it, and it said that, you know, the good news is that the uh, Raqqa has now been liberated, the caliphate is almost over, ISIS is now on the run. The bad news is now that we can focus on the 26 other conflicts that are taking place in Syria uh, and which we have neglected, of course, uh, during this time. And so we're now in a world where, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the solution of one particular problem, great, like the Middle East peace process, if it could ever take place, uh, uh, would help, but don't kid yourself that it's going to have any knock-on effect on other problems. We are in a world where uh, we may not face an existential crisis in the way that we faced uh, the balance of nuclear terror during the Cold War, but we face a world of absolutely baffling complexity. And for policymakers, you know, which problem do you start with and, uh, and which problem could at least help you to solve other problems uh, is, is a big issue. For example, is for NATO, Russia with its uh, uh, military power in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, and its hybrid activities that we'll talk about in a moment, is that something that deserves more attention as a short-term uh, issue than China, uh, which is not a military threat to NATO, but which in the long term is going to be a much greater systemic challenger in the 21st century with all of its resources, its networks, its domination of big technologies like cyber and AI. Uh, and clearly, uh, we don't need to go to China to the extent that China has already come to us. So difficult choices are to be made. In, in other words, the, the, the basic sort of characteristics are multiple fronts. You can't just deal with one problem at a time. Multiple adversaries. For the first time uh, in our strategies, we are not naming simply one country or one particular problem, but several uh, that we have to deal with at once. The United States national security strategy within two years has gone from naming uh, uh, ISIS as the main challenger to, or Al-Qaeda uh, to cyber as the main challenger uh, shortly thereafter to Russia as the main challenger uh, and, and now to China. And God knows what is going to come tomorrow. Uh, so we have multiple adversaries. I 
I'm not saying enemies, but multiple challenges or uh, adversaries. We have multiple dependencies. Uh, uh, it, it's very interesting today that many countries are torn in two directions. For example, if the United States comes to the UK, uh, which Vice President Pence and John Bolton did recently, and says, we want you to strip out Huawei uh, from your uh, uh, future 5G networks because it poses a security threat and we'll cut off intelligence uh, with you potentially if you don't do that. The UK has to think, well, OK, there's that. There's the security relationship. But what about our deep, deep, deep uh, involvement in 4G with Huawei uh, and the dependency of British telecommunications on that? What about Chinese investment in the future of British uh, nuclear power? What about that trade deal that we're hoping to conclude after Brexit? And, and virtually every country now, Turkey with the S-400s vis-a-vis -vis American patriots, uh, every country now faces this problem of multiple dependencies and which one at the end of the day is going to be uh, the uh, most important. We've got multiple domains. So we're having this debate today because, again, when I started at NATO, there were three domains of warfare, land, sea, and air. Now we've added cyberspace, we've added space. NATO will declare space as an operational domain in just a few weeks' time at its summit in London. And we've added something we'll talk about today also, the information influencing uh, what is the truth and who believes it and who dominates the narrative uh, uh, space. Uh, and uh, warfare can take place today in any one of those spaces. Strategists are still not certain which of those spaces is going to be decisive. Uh, if you dominate in four, but you're weak in two, do you lose the conflict? Uh, in the 21st century, power will go uh, not only to the country uh, or, uh, that dominates the map most spaces, but above all to the power that does the correlation of the spaces, that gets space, for example, to launch a missile from an F-35 uh, over the North Atlantic, the integration or, or, of effect to produce the greatest uh, uh, synergy. So in short, we're in a world of, 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 of competition uh, where Nobody any longer respects red lines when it comes to traditional concepts of sovereignty. As Lenin famously would have put it, what's mine is mine, what's yours is negotiable. Uh, so we see China, for example, now regularly in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean, uh, in the Baltic, investing in Iceland, investing in raw earths, in, in, in Greenland, and, and so on. Uh, it, it's no longer a, a case that we can declare any part of our geography, like the Romans declared the Mediterranean, as Mare Nostrum, uh, our sea. Whether we like it or not, we're in a world of hyper, hyper uh, competition, and we're in a world of revisionism. The EU, arguably at the moment, is the only power which is basically wedded to the status quo and what we still call the liberal uh, international order, the rules-based multilateral order. Most of the other great powers are frankly revisionist. They don't like the world as it is. The US, under President Trump, thinks the US is getting a bad deal, is being ripped off, uh, and therefore should uh, cut its commitments, except where they are demonstrably in America's uh, commercial and economic uh, interest, or in re-looking at some of the security arrangements where burdens are not being equitably shared. China and Russia both believe that they need their place in the sun, in a revamped order. New rules or no rules. New rules or no rules was the slogan at the Valdai discussion forum in Russia uh, two years ago. Iran is obviously not happy with the regional power balance in the Middle East and is trying to uh, uh, change it. So in this kind of environment of intense competition or revisionism, but in a world where still the legacy of the Cold War has endured that powers in a high-tech warfare age cannot risk uh, major uh, conflicts with incalculable uh, consequences, and no single power believes that it has the power to prevail in that kind of competition, then hybrid tactics become the instrument of choice uh, for uh, pushing your interests, for gaining influence, uh, for persuading other people to see things uh, your way, or at least have no choice but to go along uh, with your policy uh, uh, preferences, and to exploit where there are domestic polarization and debates, those debates uh, to your advantage. Uh, why is hybrid attractive? Uh, and this is going to be the background, I think, of what we'll discuss tonight. Well, first of all, attribution is difficult. 
uh, the perpetrators rarely own up to it, even if it's clear that there is a smoking gun. And if nobody admits it, even if you think you have evidence, it's very difficult to prove that in a court of law. These actions are easily deniable. It wasn't me. It was the patriotic hackers or it was the Houthis uh, uh, that launched uh, these uh, uh, systems. Um, and, and so you cover your tracks very well. Uh, we now in age of covert activities. The last time the United States formally declared war on, any, on anybody was in 19. Uh, 42. Uh, we avoid escalation uh, because in hybrid you flip it. Normally in aggression the burden of escalation is on the aggressor. In hybrid the burden of escalation is on the victim. You know, I've been attacked with chemical weapons in Salisbury. This could have been calamitous. But do I really want to risk you know, my economic relations with Russia? Do I really, is this the moment where I need uh, to uh, upscale into a confrontation? Uh, uh, you know, this, after all, is not an armed attack, is it? Uh, what is it? Legal definitions in hybrid are also very difficult. If it's not an armed attack, is it an unlawful act? There are all kinds of legal classifications, and before we know where we are, it's difficult to uh, respond. Hybrid is great because you target your victims' specific vulnerabilities. The, the one point, uh, it could be the media space, it could be an election, it could be a referendum campaign, which is uh, going to to guarantee uh, polarization and so on, and a very small effort on that vulnerable point can produce a potentially very large payoff. It's therefore potentially high gain, a very low risk, because it's not an Article 5 aggression. Uh, if you're the victim, why should another state that hasn't been attacked show solidarity? If there's a sense, well, it happened to you, it didn't happen to me. This is going to be a big issue, of course, in trying to convince people that what happened to me could have happened to you, even if it didn't, but it could have happened. The same threat is there, and you should show uh, uh, solidarity. Um, often, of course, uh, hybrid activities are perfectly legal. If Russia hacked into uh, the American election campaign, yes, maybe hacking into the Democratic uh, Party headquarters is a crime, but simply boosting through bots or, or other social media manipulation, uh, genuine American uh, 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 websites uh, or, or whatever, or blogs, and simply amplifying those messages which are convenient to your cause, whether they be the right or the left. Hybrid's not ideological. Let's get rid of that idea right from the go. Uh, we have evidence that Russia, for instance, has equally uh, uh, amplified left-wing sites, Black Lives Matter, as at, you know, National Rifle Association or gun lobby, other sites. It's what is going to cause uh, the maximum amount of, of disruption. It's a target-rich environment. You can easily shift uh, from one particular uh, target to the next, and it's cheap. Uh, running the Internet uh, Troll Factory, the so-called uh, Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which uh, uh, Prodgosin, uh, Putin's chef, is alleged to run, and carrying out these campaigns costs you barely the wing barely the wing uh, of an F-16 uh, aircraft uh, over a year. And if it doesn't succeed, no problem. You can easily try uh, again. So hybrid has multiple advantages. And of course, it's in a world where uh, the, the democratization of security, putting technology in the hands of more and more people, uh, empowers people to do disruption, which was hitherto for the monopoly of states. I mean, my favorite example is a 16-year-old kid uh, in the north of England who, uh, who actually faced his day in court and is now in prison, uh, juvenile prison, for uh, single-handedly from his bedroom without ever, ever, ever leaving his bedroom, you know, just sort of having his beans on toast after he came back from school and going upstairs, got onto his computer, radicalized himself, and actually over 12,000 miles without leaving his bedroom, uh, recruited a group of jihadists in Melbourne, Australia, uh, recruit, you know, found the money, uh, found the weapons for them, the direction, the training, everything, uh, and they were going to attack the ANZUS military parade uh, before the Australian intelligence uh, arrested them. So that means that we live in a world where anybody can attack anything, anywhere, uh, at uh, uh, any time. Anybody can be a player in this particular business. Tonight, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to keep three different types of hybrid operation in mind. The first one is what you might call influence operations. This is all about gaining a stake in your economy, your society, your politics, your media debate built up over time. 
Uh, and much of it is perfectly legal and perfectly normal. We call it globalization. If China owns 15% of European port capacity, uh, then that's fine. You know, that is normal business uh, 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 deals. But at what stage, at what stage do we start stop looking upon that as you know, normal business relationships and start, you know, as the EU is discussing at the moment, looking at rules on foreign direct in, in investment, on you know, keeping Huawei out of the so-called core 5G technology of the future European telecommunications uh, uh, systems. You know, if China, for example, does $1 billion a day with Europe, as it does, $1 billion a day of trade, does that then mean that we should draw the line, and this is a true case in Germany, where the German intelligence service uh, believes that China was behind a fake LinkedIn operation uh, trying to recruit 10,000 German uh, opinion leaders. Uh, President Macron has had a lot to say on this particular issue. Uh, to what degree do we believe that we need a European strategic autonomy to, prevent, to pr protect the sanctity, the integrity of these kind of supply chains? Do we believe that we can manage the risks when it comes to Huawei? You'll get one country that says, no, you know, the only way is to keep Huawei out because it has a relationship with the Chinese state. And you get another country like my own, the United Kingdom, says, no, 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 you know, we're sophisticated. Uh, we've set up with GCHQ, Government Communication Center, with Huawei, a technology control center. They are letting us into the source code. We can basically uh, manage the risk. This is going to be a, a, good de a big debate, you know, where countries clearly are gaining more and more influence in our domestic affairs and domestic politics, even though most of it is perfectly legal. Nothing stops Russia opening RT in Paris like it's opened RT in London or elsewhere. Where do we say stop? The second aspect of hybrid is, of course, the thing that most of you, ladies and gentlemen, this evening are probably thinking about, which is the uh, sort of uh, disruptive uh, operations, which are due to sow division, to provoke, to stabilize, to be in terms of probes, to see how we're going to uh, react. We've had a whole series, aggressive cyber attacks, aggressive uh, intelligence operations. I mentioned already the chemical incident at Salisbury, the thing that you in the Netherlands, ladies and gentlemen, have experienced with the GRU trying to hack into the organization for the, for the prevention of chemical weapons from a car park outside the building in The Hague uh, last year, the, the Russian bikers, the night wolves doing paramilitary training around the Balkans and Central and Eastern Europe, the, the, the disruption of GPS signals and radio transmission towers in Scandinavia. Uh, I could give you a whole uh, litany uh, of uh, those. And then finally, uh, the thing that NATO most worried about, looking back to the little green men that infiltrated themselves into Crimea uh, before March 2014, the hybrid action which uh, as a, a NATO senior commander, Admiral Jamie, Jamie Fogo calls it, the hyper operation where, where the prelude to war is the war. In other words, the, the, the war operation is no longer, you know, the kinetic fighting operation. It's been displaced to a foreplay area, a pre-area, where uh, the basic uh, 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 operations are taking place and where you're paralyzed and incapable of responding before you know it. You know, Crimea, obviously, the key point here, telecommunications down, internet down, mobile phones down, uh, ports uh, and airports uh, uh, occupied, government buildings occupied, TV taken over. Uh, it, you may want to respond, but suddenly you're pulling levers that no longer connect to anything any longer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this evening, I think we're going to discuss discuss uh, most of the responses that we've come up to now. I'm just, uh, as I reach the end of my time, simply going to list them in telegraph fashion. Uh, but of course, uh, number one is situational awareness. Uh, where already the United States is spending $60 billion on intelligence agencies alone. It's got 18 of them and similar proportionately, budgets going up in Europe. In other words, can I spot this thing? How can I sort of pick it up before it happens? Particularly when it's disguised to be uh, random, non-attributable, done by proxies rather than states, deniability, uh, it's designed to confuse. That's what hybrid is all about. So, you know, if I say to you this evening, after this debate, go out to Amsterdam and find me that dog, you're gonna think, my God, this guy has completely flipped. What kind of dog? But if I say uh, you're looking for a chihuahua with a pink bow tie, then you've already got what we call in NATO, 
with Iversdale, we call it early warning indicators. You need to have patterns of behavior so that you can compare what you're seeing with what a hybrid pattern would be and then see if you can cross the T's and dot the I's. So situational awareness is number one. Number two, assistance to allies in NATO and the European Union and in a cyber area as well as others. If one country is attacked, what kind of assistance can we give? Can we have sort of catalogues of responsive measures? You know, if I have a Siemens operating plant and it goes down, there's a guy in Paris in a French company who works on this. Can I get France to quickly send this guy up to my country to help? Uh, the EU has uh, some good projects here, as does NATO, to put together these kind of rapid response teams to uh, help. Thirdly, a vulnerability mapping. You know, we're now going in security, ladies and gentlemen, from an old paradigm where we looked at who was going to attack us. And then we looked at, if he wants to attack us, what is he going to attack? Now it's a little bit the other way around. We're saying, well, God, you know, what is attackable? What is vulnerable? And, and then because it's vulnerable, provides an incentive to an adversary to attack. So vulnerability mapping. Is it my electricity grid? Is it my ports? Is it my telecoms? Is it my pipeline? Uh, and uh, supply. Can I persuade this private company, which has taken on the ownership of something that used to belong to the state, to observe high standards of cybersecurity, of resilience, of robustness, uh, and build that in, even if it's not necessarily commercially very attractive to do so. Uh, we call this security uh, by uh, uh, design. And how can we stress test the system like we stress test our banks through exercises and training to make sure that it uh, is up to the job? How can can we compete in the information space? I know that the panel is going to say a lot more about this in a moment, so that my version of the truth, even if it isn't perfect, at least prevails over a whole list of lies. Uh, and not to be taken by surprise so that we lose control of the narrative uh, uh, before uh, we even start uh, and uh, uh, avoid a situation like we had when your, uh, the Malaysian air airliner was shot down over Crimea and 290 mainly Dutch citizens lost their lives where within a couple of minutes we had about 13 different versions of the story circulating around the internet and most people ended up saying, well, I don't believe Putin's version, but you know, he's muddied the waters so much that I don't believe anybody else's version as well. The truth is unknowable, so give up even the uh, effort. It's all lies. Uh, that's going to be a, a major challenge because the Massachusetts Institute of Technology has very well shown that a lie goes around the internet six times faster uh, than the truth, which is, by the way, an old phrase uh, in a new uh, uh, version. Um, investment screening and all of this so that we've got some idea if China wants to uh, persuade European countries to sign up to One Belt, One Road or whatever of what we're getting into in debt and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then fighting corruption. There's no irony, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, uh, those states in Europe which are the least uh, vulnerable to hybrid tactics like Finland and Sweden are also the least corrupt. Uh, and frankly, uh, those states which do tend to be the most vulnerable are where the corruption index, uh, the transparency index, the uh, separation of institutions and powers are, are the least impressive. It's very good, by the way, that the European Union is now setting up for the first time an anti-corruption chief prosecutor's office uh, with a candidate who is a formidable, formidable lady from Romania, uh, Laura Cavesi, to take uh, that on. Uh, and then finally, uh, resilient citizens. Uh, if we live in a world where we can't stop hybrid, you know, unlike the Soviet Union, you know, uh, the other major powers of the world are not going to collapse. It's not going to be like the end of the Cold War where they sort of take themselves away or they contain themselves in a way that the Soviet Union, by taking itself out of world trade, actually contained itself more than we contained it. These countries are going to be around for a long time and they're going to you know, be doing these competitive things for a long time to come. Uh, the best we can do is not attempt to solve this issue, but to manage, manage it. Uh, and that requires not just governments to get more savvy in the way that they cooperate, but citizens to get more savvy. I mean, already, you know, you've got Scandinavian countries forming citizens' armies of cyber experts. Uh, the private sector getting pulled more and more. We'll talk about this this evening uh, as the originator of many of the technologies. You know, is, is, for example, is Google, is it a commercial company or a national security agency? more and more a national security agency, I would argue, with the enormous uh, uh, impact and responsibility that comes with its te technology. You've got 
you know, uh, uh, in uh, Latvia, elves, uh, citizens who look, go looking for fake news and often spot it much faster than the government. So uh, resilience means resilient citizens first and foremost and how we reflect this in our education and the way that governments talk to individuals about this. So three questions to stop uh, uh, my introduction with. Uh, number one, is uh, hybrid uh, really simply another way of saying that Europe swaps US hegemony for Chinese? Hegemony Is that the inevitable outcome of the process, the shift in world power that we are uh, seeing? Number two, if we believe that Europe has to protect itself from all of this, what is strategic autonomy? What does it mean that we need to get in terms of capabilities? Uh, and how realistic uh, is it? And then finally, hybrid is taking place because there are no norms. You know, cyber, what is there? There's no START agreement or INF treaty, although these aren't uh, in the best shape these days either, are they? There's no chemical weapons convention in the field of uh, automated uh, robots uh, and autonomous firing weapon systems, the famous killer robots. Artificial intelligence is developing much faster than our ability to understand it, let alone regulate it or set down uh, rules of uh, engagement. Uh, and yet where Europe has always been successful in the past has been in the normative area, setting down the norms, you know, whether it be A4 paper or the more recently the success that the general directive on the uh, data protection, the GDPR uh, has been having. So do we swap the US for China or if not, how do we balance between them? How do we define our goal of strategic autonomy and how do we try to regulate all of this? Uh, because that's the way uh, that Europe does business and a set of rules of the road at least allow us to recognize the problem and to deal more effectively with the perpetrators. That's all for me for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Say. I have seven different things that she wrote down as solutions and three questions. But I think that many of those things indeed will come up, and I hope we talk, that we get into those topics more deeply. But I'd like to first introduce uh, the other panelists that we have and invite them up to uh, the chairs that we have. So, um, so if you could come back, Professor Shea. <laughs> and then we have um, Richa Shaki. Um, she is uh, just now going to become a director, starting in 1st of November, I believe you said, mm -hmm. uh, at the Stanford Cyber Policy Center. She is a Dutch politician uh, for D66. She was a member of the European Parliament there for 10 years, from 2009 to 2019, uh, part of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats. Uh, during her time there, she was a strong supporter of cybersecurity uh, or sanctions and more security against cyber attacks. Um, and she also is a member of the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace. Uh, I also did a bit of research on Wikipedia for you. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. And the Wall Street Journal called, said that you are Europe's most wired politician. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, during that when they, they were talking about you when you were at the European Parliament. CNN said that you are a rising Dutch star who makes increasingly rare, passionate, and public cases for liberalism and globalization. And when you left in 2019, Politico said that you are one of the 40 MEPs who mattered the most during the time that you were there. And you also published columns in the Financial Times, The Guardian, and Bloomberg. Okay. So in the last member of our panel is Dr. Max Smeets. He's a senior researcher now just starting. Actually, he was at Stanford, but now he's now in Zurich, Center for Security Studies. Uh, he's also a postdoctorate or had affiliate at Stanford, at Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation. Uh, you're also at University of Oxford's Center for Technology and Global Affairs, so lots of different uh, affiliates. You also specialize in cybersecurity. Maybe we actually they could see your front of your faces here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so maybe you could take seats. Yeah. Does it matter where? Yes. No? Okay. Take seats. Um, he specializes in cybersecurity. He just finished a current book, as I understand, yes, indeed. that focuses on underlying cyber uh, proliferation, and I certainly want to ask you about that. Um, and I also found out that in 2018, you were awarded a, the Amos Perlmutter Prize, an annual prize given by the Journal of Strategic Studies. Uh, and you also had the most outstanding manuscript submitted for publication um, to the young, uh, uh, no, that is, sorry, the award for that, sorry. But you had another award for the Young Writers Award, the German Marshall Fund. Okay, so we have a very esteemed panel, and I want to start out um, asking a little bit more about hybrid warfare. 
and I want to start a little bit from a more general aspect, and I think that you've given us a lot of information in your introductory remarks. You talked about influence operations, destructive operations, pre-war operations. You talked about the victim, it's on the onus of the victims to do something about this. We talked about definitions, and hopefully we'll get into that. But maybe the first question that I have is then for Max, because I know you're working on this book. If you could then, if we're, if we're talking about, uh, in general, uh, who maybe, and if you could give us more details, who is practicing hybrid warfare? Which countries are doing it? And what are their main tactics? Well, um, so that's a very broad question, right? And of course, as Jamie already pointed out, hybrid warfare encapsulates so many, so many different things. Um, we think about here the difference in, in how different tactics are being combined, how different technologies are being combined, and how both non-state and state actors are actually now playing an ever bigger role in this domain, and where we actually can't ever like, um, clearly, dis clearly distinguish between who's a state actor and who's a non-state actor. So that makes it, the question that you asked a really tough one like who's playing in this domain, is actually one of the essential questions. We are playing around with responsibility, we're playing around with attribution uh, in a number of different ways. Um, so before, just one point, before I could even answer it is, okay, we see a wide range of different activity going on, and the kind of hybridness of what Chinese actors are doing is very, very different from the hybridness that, let's say, uh, Russia uh, is doing as well. And so that, that would actually, it doesn't directly answer your question on who is doing what. You can say every actor is, is combining different tactics today to, to, to their benefit, and every actor, especially today, and that's, I think, a crucial point, is actually not so much conducting armed conflict, right? But as, as Jamie pointed out, every actor is playing, in, as they realize, an ever bigger role in this space below armed conflict, where we see today that uh, these small actions cumulatively can have great impact and still strategic effects. We don't longer need to roll our tanks over the border to actually uh, achieve a certain outcome, but instead we can really have to think about questions around interdependence, which, which one scholar once called weaponized interdependence, and see how it all fits together. So from that perspective, when we see this space opening up, everything going on below the threshold of armed attack, every actor is involved. Um, so we're, if we take this out of the pure warfare domain, we see every actor which, which is forced in, 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 many, um, in many ways. Um, so, well, we'll get to the like, probably most specifics in detail around cyber on, on, and some of the solutions. I'll um, leave that unless you wanted me to address oh, that. Oh, no, no, we'll go okay. to it. Maybe as a follow-up question, Rich, I could ask you, of these, these different actors that we're talking about, who do you think we, might, we should worry about the most? I think we should be aware of what our own self-interests are and how our values ought to be protected. So I think for Europe especially, this has been the perspective that I've you know, taken uh, for a long time, and I, I think it's important here too, that we understand what is at stake and how many uh, you know, different forces, whether it's nation states, like uh, Jamie mentioned, uh, the rise of China as a geopolitical actor with a very assertive and at times aggressive agenda on, on many levels, not just in the whole uh, digital domain and, and conflict area, but really also just you know, having a bigger influence in setting standards, in, in shaping the debates, in peacekeeping, in you know, trade, in all areas. So it's, it's, I think, very important to see the whole question of the digital uh, domain hybrid conflict as part of the power relations in the world. And this is where, uh, for Europe, there's a lot of catching up to do. Uh, very clearly, and you saw that in, in the example that Jamie also gave, uh, the question about Huawei, can we, can we trust them? Firstly, this is not as if we're starting at, at the zero line and we can take a decision and then go forward. There's already a ton of Huawei technology in Europe, whether it's networks, whether it's personal devices, etc. But then suddenly, Europe gets confronted with its own fragmentation as well, on a, I would say, relatively simple question. So you have you know, allegations of, of an ally saying, do not use this technology. Uh, you have uh, a single market in Europe that supposes supposed to have one set of rules for all 28 member states, but you have national security on 28 different national levels. And so it is hard for Europe 
if it doesn't change, to play this geopolitical role where the dots are connected, where we understand that a trade interest cannot be seen separately from a technology question, cannot be seen separately from uh, human rights issues, for example. Because I think the whole question of reliability of technology in all aspects really weaves these, these elements together. If uh, there are, let's say, uh, you know, hidden back doors or, or vulnerabilities that can be exploited in uh, elements of the devices we use every day, which you know, are alleged to be able to be weaponized. They can be opened up for, let's say, disabling the device, but maybe also opened up for tapping into the communications going over the device. And so this can have implications for security, but also for, for human rights, for corporate espionage, etc. So I think it's very important that we, we don't try to, which is a, a tendency in the debate about technology, to see technology as a topic, you know, like, oh, we're going to talk about trade, and then we're going to talk about technology, and then we're going to talk about defense, but to really see how technology is a layer of everything and therefore our interests, but also our values are at stake throughout many dimensions. And this is where the hybrid element also means, you know, um, technologies for civilian use can be instrumentalized for state purposes. The lines are blurring. Lines are blurring between the role of private companies and the role of governments without very clear chains of, of responsibility and oversight. It's, it's really a layer. Uh, that's how, how I think we should think about it. And we need to articulate more clearly um, where we want to be in this debate and, and what, uh, what the core threats are uh, to our democracy, our uh, security, and our freedoms here. But then I, see, I think that you very much agree with the first comment that Jamie said about China, the shift because it seems you're talking about the, the complexity of what, how China is doing as in the trade uh, and the corporate, all those things together, uh, that you would agree that it's part of the, the shift. I think what we see China doing very systematically is to use technology in every aspect as an extension of its governance model. You know, op make it optimal for control, make it optimal for uh, maximum influence, let's say dependence of others, so basically to maximize its position of mm. power. I don't see the same kind of strategic considerations on the European side. Uh, and, and the challenge here is that, that there's another kind of ch change, I think, in, in this whole um, hybrid conflict um, area, which is that the most advanced countries can, by definition, become the, the most vulnerable, because the more connectivity, the more opportunity for attack, which Traditionally, you would imagine the most advanced economies also have the most ability to defend and the most resources to protect their interests. Here, if you don't have any connectivity, it's hard to attack. So that there is a lot of, uh, I would say, asymmetry mm -hmm. in the relations or different, different uh, relations appearing compared to the ones we, we are used to where it's mostly a question of you know, territory, wealth, capabilities in the more traditional uh, sense. So those that, that are more technology adv technologically advanced are more vulnerable in this case. If they're not careful, and I think we're not careful enough uh, as Europeans, yes, mm -hmm. then, then the connectivity, more, more devices online, smart fridges, you know, uh, smart grids, everything smart, 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 smart cities, also becomes a potential weakness if it gets uh, instrumentalized, infiltrated, um, manipulated for other people's mm. interests. And I, I think that that's, or other actors, I should say, uh, interests. And um, uh, the fact that it's not always a state saying, here's, here's our attack, thank you very much, uh, you know where to find us, makes it even harder to even respond to this and, and to, to assess uh, you know, on what level the threat should be understood. As the same as saying, it's designed to confuse, designed to be hidden. So that, no, I'm, that. I'm going to shift a little bit here. And, and you mentioned in your um, introductory remarks about an Article 5 action and that it wasn't mm -hmm. part of the um, collective security. Um, and I also made, made me think of this 30% of the NHS that was attacked through oh, a cyber the, attack as one, well. Wanna cry, yeah, the wanna cry of virus. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, at, at that time, obviously, it wasn't an Article 5 situation. But recently, um, General, Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg did say, 
and he argued that a cyber attack would trigger Article 5. Um, and I just wondered if you could, if you would actually agree with that, and maybe under what circumstances, maybe possibly an attack on a nuclear command and control system, that this might then be something that would trigger it. Uh, yeah, it, it's a good question. Uh, the, you, one of the elements of deterrence uh, has always been, you know, keeping your adversary in doubt uh, about how you're going to respond, uh, because what an adversary wants is certainty. You know, I, I'm going to sort of touch you on the cheek and I know you're not going to respond, uh, provided I keep it below a certain threshold. Uh, and, and so it's good in, so that NATO has declared that potentially a, a cyber attack, it would have to be a pretty severe one, obviously, uh, could trigger Article 5, because then a potential aggressor has to think, well, you know, I can't sort of provoke NATO up to there, knowing that NATO's not going to respond, uh, and providing I don't go over that line, I'll be fine. So it, it's, it's a good form of PR, if you like, or at least it's a good form of communication strategy to say, maybe, you know, be careful, you don't know how we're going to respond, you know, we might respond more severely than you think, and keep your adversary guessing. That said, I believe that privately, not publicly, so maybe I shouldn't be saying it here, but privately, you know, NATO should start thinking about, well, you know, what would a scenario be the where we would consider that, legally speaking, this would be the equivalent of an armed attack? I mean, obviously, given the disruption that can be caused, uh, electrons could do the same damage as bullets in the modern age for the various uh, scenarios that were mapped out. You know, if, if you blind my space navigation system, uh, which is possible now uh, because of uh, one of the big areas of security is the cyber vulnerability of space-based assets, which are proliferating. We've got 1,700 major satellites already in space, and more and more people are getting into the game. Uh, uh, and the satellites have got far less cyber security than electricity plants or nuclear power plants on the ground. That could be considered, you know, because you completely destabilize all of my targeting, all of my early warning, all of my meteorological mapping, the lot. That could be considered, yeah, the equivalent of firing an you know, anti-satellite weapon and taking them out. So there is that. Artificial intelligence also, you know, if it gets to the stage uh, where one country, you know, maximizes the majority of the world's data and is able to feed that into to highly sophisticated computer systems that could provide almost sort of total certainty about the vulnerabilities of, a, of an adversary, uh, that could be the equivalent of a nuclear attack. Absolutely, in terms of the paralysis mm -hmm. that it could uh, potentially uh, uh, cause. Or the ability to use artificial intelligence and pattern recognition to create swarms uh, of drones. We're seeing this more and more, swarms of drones that sort of overwhelm uh, a defense uh, of, of, of another country. Um, so uh, you know, we're now going into what Audius Huxley would have called the brave new world, uh, where you know, these things are possible. Uh, and so you know, what, it, what declaring Article 5 does for NATO is it at least opens the door to say, guys, it's legitimate to think about this. You know, we may not have an answer, but it's legitimate to think about this, that you know, in the 21st century where uh, attacks are coming in all shapes and sizes, we can no longer reserve Article 5 only for a mass attack of tanks through the Fulda Gap, that single scenario. And in fact, you know, by declaring Article 5 for the first time uh, in the wake of the terrorist attacks on 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, even if NATO didn't respond immediately, you know, NATO opened that door to say, look, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, my insurance cover can't just apply, you know, to one bedroom in my house. We have to, you know, as the house expands, the insurance cover has to go with all of the new things that we're building on. So more than land, air and sea, but also cyber. Yes, you want to Could ask Could you come that? in? Yeah, just the interesting thing here is, is, or it's actually unsurprising, right, if a cyber attack specifically causes as many battle deaths or deaths in general than a conventional attack, that it could trigger Article 5, right? But what is interesting is actually that so much of the activity doesn't actually cause deaths, and so much of the activity is still really, really important, right? And so it kind of, NATO with this also sidesteps a lot of the really important and interesting questions that we actually addressed here in, in, the, in the opening um, uh, talk, and also here at the panel around interdependence, about trade, about weaponization, about uh, disinformation, all of those things, right? So when, when, when Stoltenberg comes out and says, like, 
a cyber attack could trigger Article 5. Yeah, it, it could. But actually, what we're seeing today is 99.99999% of the activity is of a very different nature. And that's where NATO has to think very hard yeah. as to what its role is. Let me, if I may, and, come in on this one, because uh, I should have made this point, and you've made it. But you're absolutely right. The problem for for declaring Article 5 and cyber is that the Allies may sort of hesitate and wait, saying, well, you know, is it really Article 5? Let's get more evidence, you know, let's have a, you know, a follow-on sort of attack before we do anything. And you get to the situation where, you know, if you've only got a hammer, the problem has to be a now. Because if the problem is not a now, you can't you, use the hammer. And, and this would be paralyzing for NATO, you know, in the sense that, you know, well, you know, he's hit me here, he's hit me there, but unless he hits me on the nose, I'm not, I'm not gonna do anything. Uh, there's only one scenario that we're prepared to respond to, because that's an invitation to an aggressor to say, well, you know, provided I don't hit the nose, I can do anything I like. Uh, and you can't, you know, like in football, you know, a strategy of we're only gonna defend and we're never gonna try to score a goal. Uh, the other part of the pitch is a recipe for losing every game, right? You can't construct any kind of security policy purely on defense, even if obviously you've got to make the defense better, you know, make it harder for the aggressor, have, you know, bounce back, have more resilience. You've got to have response options. And one of the, and, and so you're absolutely right about this. One of the big things in NATO is to say, look, you know, we've got Article 4 of the treaty. We've got other parts of the treaty that allow us to do things short of Article 5, not military things. But you saw after the Salisbury attack uh, that to NATO countries, EU as well, simultaneously evicted a large number of Russian diplomats. Now, did that get Putin's attention? Did it, did it make him or others stop? Probably not, but it was probably a bigger reaction than what he had anticipated. And, and you know, it may persuade him to think again. And down in Brussels, both the EU and NATO are busy working on things we call playbooks. Sorry for the jargon, playbooks. And I was looking at, you know, what are the measures that we've got? You know, protest notes, economic sanctions. In Germany, there's been a big debate about hacking back, you know, do we mm. hack back? Does also the private, in this country. Does the private sector hack back, you yeah. know, under, under what conditions? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, the usual things, you know, and the repertoire. Uh, of course, the, the jury is still out on what works, because we may feel good, you know, oh, we've done this, we've expelled Russian diplomats, but of course, what we're trying to do is change the calculus of our adversary. Now, in the old days of nuclear deterrence, you knew pretty well that possessing nuclear weapons worked in changing the calculus of your adversary. You got his attention. Where we're still sort of, you know, finding our way through trial and error is what elements of this playbook uh, could work. I mean, the, the just final point on this, the, the EU has uh, had a good summit with, uh, with China, uh, good in the sense that the European Commission uh, in the spring published this very robust uh, you know, EU-China strategy, which said, yes, we have to cooperate with China, but eyes wide open, right? You know, China's a competitor, we need to defend our interests. We can't, as Macron said, we can't be naive. And when the, they met with China, they looked at the playbook and they said, right, you know, we're gonna get tough. You know, we, you know, we're not going to stop cooperation, of course not, but we're going to ask, you know, China to give us a, a, an investment uh, a agreement. We're going to get more robust protection of European intellectual property, you know, uh, better conditions for EU companies, you know, these kind of things. So that's part of the playbook as well. You know, how can I, you know, also do things which, you know, mean that I'm not sort of, sort of taken for granted. But I, yeah, I think what you see in this discussion, whether it's about Article 5 or other norms or laws is that there's a lot of thresholds undefined or not clearly defined. And so, mm. you know, if I may slap you in the face, you know, everybody may think, wow, that's unfair. He, now he has to do something. But if we never agreed that I wasn't supposed to slap you in the face, it's harder to come back to a rule and, and things like that. And yeah. the, the rules yeah. and the norms, just like the clarity of Article 5, essentially, uh, in, in other uh, contexts, indicates that there's at least an agreed line in the sand. And, and with regard to the whole hybrid and digital um, arena, you know, the, the only criterion cannot be whether people die. Because you can really undermine, let's say, people's rights to vote uh, in an election. Or you can, you know, you can do the same as, as crossing a border, for example, right? Like, so the integrity of, of territory is, is uh, quite important in international law between, between countries, but you know, how does that play out uh, online when you start to touch uh, the state infrastructure? And then will 
will public administrations, politicians know about this mm -hmm. when it happens only in the sight of the private companies that have built the, the critical infrastructure and that are protecting it? So the, the lines in, in general, so not only in NATO context, but more broadly, the lines are not clear and therefore you can endlessly debate about whether a line has been crossed at all. So I think it's very important to start drawing those lines, to come up with norms, to build alliances and coalitions, which will look different than only between states, to say, we're not going to, us, like the people who agree, maybe not everybody, but we're going to start to build those lines. And this is the way non-proliferation treaties have began. This is the way we, we once decided that maybe cluster munition was so harmful that we're not going to use it anymore. So you, you always have to start somewhere to build the threshold. And, and that's what needs to happen, I think, now beyond uh, NATO and, and certainly uh, with European leadership, but also within the EU, you know, to, to say this is the minimum safeguards that we expect from countries, this is the, the quality of the systems that we require, this is how we're going to measure, this is how we're going to act, to start, yeah, not only a playbook, but maybe more of a, yeah, sort of scenarios and, and clarity on uh, what is required as a minimum. But that shows, I think, also the fundamental tension that we face here today, right? What is fascinating is when we think about nuclear deterrence, and you mentioned deterrence, you mentioned red lines. Yeah. There, we famously said we have this crystal ball effect, right? There is a certainty here that by me acting, uh, I might, this might lead to X, Y, Z and, 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 and to, to a situation that no one wants, right? It was a very clear case and, and of course a number of different kind of initiatives and programs and ideas came out of that all the way to the doomsday machine where there was an absolute certainty that another would act. And all these game theoretical models that were developed um, by, by academics, experts at Rand Corporation all showed that more certainty works, especially in the case of deterrence. What we're now saying, and you see this also in the NATO debate and in the EU debate, you see this kind of play. Well, also, but hey, flexibility is really good. Uncertainty leads to more deterrence. And so actually what you see in the, both in the NATO and the EU context is like, yeah, we need to have playbooks. Yes, they need to be sure about a response. Yes, we need to have red lines. And equally, they say, yes, you know, there needs to be flexibility. We're not sure what we're going to do. We want to leave our options open. And it's really kind of a fundamental tension. And you might say, well, politicians or policymakers and experts tr like are delicately balancing this. But actually, if you look at the kind of track record where we clearly see that in this broad space, I think deterrence is failing, I wonder whether they actually are trying to, to put this kind of, to have this delicate balance or whether they are aware of it at all. And I think that's really problematic. To some degree, mm. you could try to get there through sort of exercises and training. Uh, and uh, the EU, NATO, at the leadership level, interestingly, uh, are now doing more of these kind of simulations where you put a scenario up and mm -hmm. then you see to what degree people see eye to eye, to what degree they interpret what they're seeing in the same way, prepared to act. The European Union tried this uh, a year or so ago under the Estonian presidency where they organized something called Cybrid with European defense ministers and they simulated uh, various cyber attacks on the EU uh, maritime presence, uh, Sofia in the Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, it quickly came out, of course, that you know, the way in which various ministers were prepared to cla uh, classify the attack were very different. You know, basically, the farther east you were <laughs> on the map, the more you were prepared, you know, to sort of name and shame Russia or to declare that this was a hostile act. And the more you were towards the south of, of, of Europe, the more cautious you, you were. So, so in terms of that kind of understanding of what's going on, uh, lots of differences still. Uh, all, as I said, hybrid often only affects one country. So it's easy to say, well, you know, really sorry that your banking sector was hit, but mine wasn't hit. So, you know, why should I? I put my neck on the line. Uh, you know, the old NATO Article 5, where Russia was more or less crossing three or four different country borders at the same time, made it easier to generate that kind of solidarity. But hybrid, because it is under that kind of threshold, it, you know, countries could be left alone, really, uh, uh, to deal with this. Uh, and so this issue of solidarity is important. In the Lisbon Treaty of the European Union, uh, sorry to get a bit technical here, folks, but there are two uh, 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 provisions, uh, 42.7 and 222, which for the first time allow the EU to look at mechanisms of mutual solidarity, mm -hmm. like these cyber response teams, or even now counter-hybrid support teams, and you know, uh, sort of 
yellow pages kind of lists of what each country has, uh, which could potentially be sent to another country. And of course, France tried this out uh, for the first time by invoking it after the terrorist attacks in Paris uh, a few years ago. But, but this is something, at least legally, which opens up that scope for European uh, solidarity. But then, you know, you get into questions of attribution, uh, because attribution is never perfect. Uh, and you know, if you've ever you know, watched TV, which all of you have, and probably in the Netherlands, you have these kind of sports quizzes where they say, we're going to put on the uh, screen a picture of a well-known footballer. And they start with the guy's nostril. And there's always a genius in the room who says, that's David Beckham. And my God, how does he know that? Incredible. You know? uh, and attribution is a bit like that. You know, Some countries with very little <laughs> evidence are willing to say, it's you. Why? Because it's always you. You know, it's like Lord Voldemort in Harry Potter. It's always Lord Voldemort. Others say, no, 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 we want absolute, you know, crystal proof. Every piece of the jigsaw puzzle filled in before we can act. Uh, and then again, as I said earlier, differences over the playbook, you know, how fast you want to go and escalate. So to some degree, you know, we, we need in the EU as well as NATO, you know, through exercising, through training, to the use of intelligence, which is always a bit difficult these days, you know, particularly mm -hmm. after Iraq in 2003. Can I really rely upon the intelligence that you're giving me? But we've got to sort of try to create a, a, a better understanding of what we see, as you rightly say, the thresholds where we feel right. You know, this is something for all of us because this is serious to concern us all. Because the only way that you're going to deal with hybrid u of, uh, warfare is by unity. You know, unity is the most powerful thing. A weak thing endorsed by 50 countries has much greater effect than a very strong thing endorsed only by one country. Uh, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis China, the extent of the EU to adopt this sort of unified stance uh, is really going to be the most important thing. Indeed, you have answered some of my questions already that I had about unity and Oh, we can think European, of a few more. So that's good. But maybe just one last comment on this part, because I think we've had a very good discussion here. But maybe, inadvertently, Trump stumbled on having some sort of um, line or the deterrence that you were talking about. Because in February last year, he said the circumstances in which the US would use nuclear weapons included a cyber attack on the command and control structures of a nuclear system. Yeah. So I think that's maybe at the very minimum, OK, if, if you meddle in our nuclear, then we will have a nuclear response. But I'm not uh, sure if it was tweeted or not, but that's indeed uh, something that the Trump had said. Let's on, go on to a different topic. I want to talk about um, fake news. Um, and my question is, are democracies, and I think we sort of alluded to this already a little bit, is the openness that we have in democracies, are, does it make them more vulnerable when you have this weaponizing, um, do we have institutional vulnerabilities when you have the weaponizing of information, when you're talking about cyber warfare? And then I have this concept of sharp power. I don't know if that's a concept that you're... Yeah, um, Professor Nye. Basic you had. Yeah. So the new concept that, that Joseph Nye, who, is, um, who has sort of the soft power concept, the sharp power, when he talks about information flows that, that, that um, Th authoritarian societies can use sharp power because um, autocracies control information in their own societies, but yet the openness of democracies, these are the vulnerabilities that autocrats exploit. So things like, we didn't mention, um, so how can we have mentioned disseminating fake news, astroturfing, the sort of idea that um, you mask, that it's not grassroots, that you're masking the, the, the actual source. So I want to know, um, what, can we say something about the vulnerability of societies, how we might um, do something about that vulnerability, uh, and what about this, maybe this concept of sharp power? And would you like to start? Yes, so I am not a fan of the term fake news um, because, you know, people can say, guess what, the earth is flat and it's not illegal. Uh, it's also... Yeah. There's a whole society, yeah, that's, uh, in yeah. the United States. That, Fairly uh, profitable as well, profitable, I think. Yeah, yeah. Us, yeah. So, but the point is that, that um, there's actually century-old discussion about what is true and, you know, it has merit also when it's done according to certain certain uh, methods, etc. So the whole idea that anyone can determine what is true, uh, I think, and what is allowed to be said, I think it's very tricky. 
We have some exceptions uh, in Europe, like in a number of countries, it's, it's not allowed to, um, to deny the Holocaust, for example, uh, and hate speech uh, is you know, restricted. But in general, I am a big believer of free speech, but I think what's important to understand is not so much that this is uh, an effort or a strategy or tactic to convince of an alternative reality, let's stick with the example of the Earth is flat, but it's really to, and, and Jamie touched upon this already, to sort of erode the trust that anything might be trustworthy as such. So the example of MH17, of course, is extremely um, well painful and, and very difficult in this country because uh, there's still no accountability of the perpetrators. Uh, the losses have touched uh, almost every you know, sports club, village, family, school, uh, political party. In our case, uh, we lost uh, people. Um, and the idea that People that I also know personally would say, well, I don't know what to believe anymore. I'm not going to believe anything anymore. May actually be the desired effect. Because if people start to check out, if people are not going to trust institutions anymore or be willing to engage in a public debate or be willing to engage in a democracy because they think it doesn't matter at all, you know, this checking out is already a huge damage to liberal democracy. And so, what I think is helpful when you want to deal with this is to, first of all, try to understand what is, what is the bigger picture behind this. Because I think we lost a lot of time by talking about fake news and, and this notion that anyone can determine what is true and what isn't, and that from a distance people could mark websites as being trustworthy or not. I think it's the wrong approach. What I do think is very helpful is to look at the methods from a technological um, point of view. So the idea, I mean, you know, I was in politics for 10 years. Imagine that you would be standing outside of this door and you would hear uh, me saying a few things and then a huge applause. And then you might think, wow, I mean, I hope I can get in. This sounds like a popular meeting. But then you come in and effectively you see me standing here and there is a speaker blasting the applause. It's kind of a different effect if I was able to convince, let's say, a crowd of people or no one at all, but I'm actually faking the notion that people are applauding for me. It, it will give you a very Im different impression about me. Now, this kind of amplified support, let's say, uh, you know, thumbs up be, be, uh, below a tweet or a message on Facebook or uh, X amount of followers, uh, X amount of, of uh, support for, for a message is something that is really very powerful online. It suggests popularity. People want to be part of the winning team, even though these thumbs up and these support messages, etc., may not may not belong to people. <clears throat> so, patterns of uh, amplification, uh, you know, tweets that get sent out uh, every. 13 seconds during 42 hours are probably not going to be sent by a person. It's just like too systematic. So the, the methods, I believe, deserve more attention than the message because I'm, I'm, I'm very um, worried about um, steps that are proposed to fight fake news that actually are eroding the open societies and the democracies that we want to protect themselves. Just like with counterterrorism measures, we've seen the same, that in the name of defense, we've actually eroded our freedoms, and that's a big problem. So, to simplify, I would like to focus more on the how and not so much on the what, because if people want to say crazy stuff, uh, I think that should be their freedom. And I'm happy to defend that freedom uh, of people, even if I vehemently disagree with them. But the problem is also that new methods uh, are undermining uh, the trust as such, and that's something that we we need to look at. And it, the last thing I'll say about it, it also very much depends on the foundation of trust that was there in the first place. So <clears throat> you cannot have uh, technologies or uh, a solution to disinformation replace a lack of trust when it wasn't there at all. Mm. In this country, there is relatively high trust. Uh, and so it's also easier to get through waves of new methods of, of disinformation because the foundation is solid. In other countries, the foundation may not be solid, and so the, the disinformation and the, the methods of disruption have deeper impact because the, the basis was not so strong to begin with. Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, maybe just two minor points, though I agree with basically everything uh, Marie just said. One of the challenges here, of course, is, is perhaps democracies are, are more vulnerable, but when we think about the major platforms and where they are based uh, in a very small geographical area, when we think about particularly Facebook and Twitter and 
I don't really regard Ubuntu as a, as a major platform and so on. Um, there is still the question of how much do they know about specific contexts in certain areas and how does that sure. affect content moderation and so on. And so what we indeed have seen is that many of these platforms particularly focus on the methods of distribution rather than on, on what has been said already. Um, and so I, I couldn't agree more. Just one other point that, that, that a former colleague always used to say of me and is that fake news can be really damaging, but real news too, right? And um, sadly, what we sometimes forget, particularly around the internet, is that really the most harm is still caused by some things that me as a scholar do not really focus on, and many of us do, do not, and that's maybe some, some asshole, if part of me, will share photos of, of a young girl and demand more photos, and as a result of that, um, this girl commits suicide. Now, that happens on a, on a daily basis through Facebook, through Twitter. You might call that real information or whatever is shared, uh, but it's hugely damaging, and, um, and it, it's sometimes forgotten in these big debates, especially following the US, uh, US election, and when we talk about disinformation, about the, the real daily harm that's caused on the internet that is actually like taking lives on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, 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 I know you already got, mentioned sort of this resilience yeah. population. And well, indeed, I, I, you know, I speak with two, two very knowledgeable people on this subject. Uh, 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 but my, my sense is that the, the, the first thing that we need to sort out uh, in all of our societies is how we guarantee space for the traditional press. I don't mean traditional press in terms of, you know, the telegraph, you know, always coming out of the newspaper in the same way, because obviously uh, there's, there's going to be major changes in the digital age. But, uh, you know, when even in Western democracies you get people like Berlusconi only owning all of or controlling all of the Italian TV stations or certain newspaper magnets who are controlling a vast majority uh, of the national press, more and more local newspapers are sort of folding, so that you know, people turn to social media and other sources for their news because they don't have you know, access to their local paper like they used to have. And, and the business model in terms of advertising revenues has made many of these traditional newspapers uh, unsustainable. Everybody expects to get information free of charge. Uh, in my mind, the, you know, the, the way to start dealing with this is what do we do you know, to preserve the space for uh, the press to perform its traditional function, for journalists to be able to survive, to do their work, even when it's very uncomfortable when they uncover scandals, but that's their job, right? Uh, their job is not to be popular with politicians. Uh, 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 you know, uh, and just keep, keep that space open, because uh, you know, we always sort of say, ah, you know, people are abandoning newspapers and going to the social media. But in reality, you know, there aren't the same uh, coverage nationally of, of newspapers. This is particularly a problem in the United States, where major newspapers, you know, Chicago Tribune, the Philadelphia Inquirer, you know, Boston Globe, you know, are literally closing uh, every uh, uh, week. Because the best way for combating fake news is to have you know, a, a normal function of journalists in society fact-checking and, and all of these kind of things. And we need to think about what we do. You know, does government subsidize newspapers? I don't know. But you know, not taxing newspapers? Or, or, but anyway, what we can do to keep, keep that space, because that's where it starts. Uh, obviously, where uh, you have regulation, for example, in the UK, uh, Oftel, which is the media regulator, is fining RT virtually every week, not banning it, because that would be uh, a constraint on freedom of speech, which I agree with, but at least, you know, hauling it over the coals with big fines when it clearly refuses to correct uh, uh, fake news for want of a, a better uh, uh, term. Um, but I think the real problem is not with democracies, because democracies are always rowdy. They've always had fake news. Politicians have always told lies, even if sometimes our politicians could set an example, right? Because it's you know, very difficult for me to criticize authoritarians for clamping down on the media when politicians in our own world call the press the enemy of the people, mm. right? Yeah. Or you know, the fake news, newspaper, or so on. Uh, it, it doesn't help, frankly, when the defenders of democracy don't defend mm. it. Uh, but um, the, the real problem for me is in authoritarian countries. That's the real problem. Uh, who are being denied information. Uh, for example, I, on the tallies coming up from Brussels, I was reading a fascinating piece that in China now, 
any journalist who wants to have a sure. journalist license, you've seen this, yeah. has to take a, you course. Know, a course on uh, knowledge of the, of the philosophy of President Z, not Mao Zedong's little red book, the modern equivalent, Z thought, as it's called, you know, and, and only one chance to redo the exam if that person fails, and that person can never be a journalist. So, you know, the, Pass, for, pass, it's a contradiction. To be a journalist, you have to, first of all, demonstrate ideological conformity. You know, we could talk for ages about artificial intelligence now being used for you know, facial recognition, for social media registration, for social media credits. You know, what's happening to the Uyghurs, this idea of control. But I think the real issue, uh, with China now, by the way, exporting these uh, population control monitoring technologies to 34 different countries in the world who are keen to use them. The real problem is that we're going to have about you know, 60% of humanity uh, by the middle of the 21st century, if we're not careful, who will be basically deprived of information. Uh, well, you can't deal with fake news if you don't have any information at all, except what the government tells you uh, in, in, the, in the first place. So I think you know, we need to look at that aspect of it uh, uh, as well. But, but those differences also play out in Europe. I mean, when you talk about, let's say, public uh, interest broadcasters or having a pluralist debate that may also be supported by public resources, in a country like the Netherlands, that's basically the model, at least in the sort of traditional media environment. But if you would suggest the same to a Hungarian, yeah. you know, their hairs would, would stick up. So I do think that we have to think about different contexts, and that's what a lot of social media companies don't do, and that makes it quite uh, disruptive, because what might actually blend in to a mature media landscape in the Netherlands as one of the options mm -hmm. may become the only option uh, you know, in another country where, on top of that you have a very, very aggressive business model where we're, we're truly no longer talking about the online public square, which is a metaphor that some people use and which the companies themselves really love to use, you know, that they are just there to facilitate many different voices. Yeah. But it has actually literally become a marketplace of ideas. If you bring money, your post uh, rises to the top. And so it creates this manipulated, commercially manipulated uh, information flows over which there is no oversight. And I think that that's another element I talked, I talked a little bit uh, before about sort of um, automated uh, influencing that could be, for example, for a political purpose or for undermining trust in liberal democracy. But I think the other big, big story of the digital revolution is that digitization often means privatization and the oversight is completely asymmetrical completely asymmetrical. And so we don't even know a lot of things. Like we don't really know why anti-vaxxer uh, information, you know, people suggesting that um, vac vaccinating children against measles is, is bad for your kids, why it is surfacing to the top. Is it because they are paying for it? Yeah, it happens. And there's measles outbreaks now showing that even if you convince only a small part of the population, you can have, you know, decisive impact. And in democracies, it's not that different. A lot of a lot of elections are won on small margins. So if you can influence a small amount of the people, uh, and and if researchers, I'm not talking about the police looking at this, but understanding more of how how information that we've always said is power. I mean, information is power, not without reason. You mentioned if there's a coup, oftentimes first somebody appears on state television to declare who's in power <laughs> now. The idea that information is power is, is a centuries old wisdom. And yet we've allowed for the privatization of vast amounts of our information flows to advertising companies. They're, you know, they don't claim to be media companies. We're not suggesting they're media companies. They're literally selling ads. And there's a whole ecosystem behind it of algorithms, of machine learning, of artificial intelligence, of perhaps disinformation, but also a lot of commercial interests, people writing blogs just because that's how they can make money, uh, or, or um, you know, to place ads against theories of flat earths and whatnot because they can make money. And so we need to know much more in order to have smart decisions about how we can make our, our open and democratic societies more resilient. And we simply don't have that access right now. And I think that that's a huge problem as well. But is it also an idea to increase assistance to civil society, maybe groups that are uh, transparency organizations, NGOs that are working, and is it also to, to fund it's always those a good thing well? to It's always a good thing to have a resilient civil society, but the reality of the matter is that a lot of civil society organizations researching technology are funded by technology companies. Actually, a lot of tech money is also now funding academia. 
Um, so the question is, what kind of uh, support would that be? And I don't think it's a replacement for actual accountability and oversight in the public interest. Because you know, if, if a parliamentarian cannot understand the algorithm of Facebook, Amnesty International cannot either. Like it has to be, I think the oversight has to be regulated with, with law uh, in the public interest. And I don't see a replacement of civil society taking on that role. Okay, right. Um, I want to switch. We, artificial intelligence has been named various times, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. <coughs> and it's certainly part of cyber war, and we could say it's a part of sharp power that I already mentioned. Um, but it's also tied to new weapon systems, and you talked about facial recognition, those sorts of things. So maybe, um, and maybe this is a bit more pushing it, are autonomous weapons that are with, um, on, with artificial intelligence, like killer robots or things that have machine learning logarithms, is this science fiction or is it becoming a reality? Is, are these weapons inevitable? Uh, is it also part of the whole cyber warfare? And then maybe how do we counter those kinds of attacks? I have a few things to kick, just kick us off. I mean, if, well, first of all, like with most uh, developments, it, it's coming soon to a theater near you. Uh, you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. So we don't have to debate whether we want to deal with this or don't want to deal with this. Uh, we're going to have to deal with it. And like all technologies, it will be uh, ubiquitous quicker than we thought. You know, we always think that it's going to hit in 20 years' time, and then we wake up one morning and, and it's already here. Yeah. Um, in a way, like with everything, every technology, there's a good side and a bad side. Nothing is ever purely good. Nothing is ever purely bad. It all depends on how we use it. Uh, the real issue uh, is that, in the main, uh, in the past, uh, Western countries developed the technologies first and therefore were able to set the rules of the road that others had to follow when they acquired technologies. We're now, however, though, in a situation where it's highly likely, uh, particularly again looking at China, which is investing four times uh, as many, uh, uh, four times as much money than the United States in artificial intelligence uh, research, uh, which is graduating eight times. Uh, more university students every year than the United States, and now double the number of PhDs a year than the United States. Uh, the, the, you know, the states which are not necessarily going to want to follow the rules will develop these systems first, and we'll have a kind of two-tier system. For example, you spoke of killer robots. I am relatively certain I, I, uh, that in the NATO countries, as, as the battlefield becomes increasingly robotized, which has enormous advantages. You know, if you fly a drone somewhere and it gets shot down, your pilot doesn't get killed. You don't have to pay a lot of money to a foreign government for ransom money to get that guy home, you know. Uh, it, it, so there are sort of advantages here. Uh, a drone can loiter over the target for a long time. Believe it or not, I know these are unsavory topics, right? But this is military reality. A drone can loiter over a target, gather a lot of information, and strike more accurately than an aircraft, which often drops the bomb on the wrong target. We call that collateral damage with terrible results. So, so having more discriminate type of weapons, if we're going to have to have weapons in the first place, uh, is better than dumb bombs, right? But uh, my big worry is that we will follow rules. For example, I'm sure that with what we call killer robots, but autonomous systems. The human being will be in the loop. Uh, you know, there's the famous Asimov principles. So remember the famous scientist Isaac Asimov a few years ago uh, for uh, technology, which is the human being has to stay in the loop. Uh, uh, you know, the, the thing has to be stoppable, uh, for example, reprogrammable and so on. Uh, and uh, the human being will be, will be in a loop uh, and that most of these things will be used in support functions, like determining that your car needs a service in, in three hundred miles because it's monitored things that you can't see. Those kind of logistic support functions rather than battlefield functions, particularly where it becomes a question of life and death. My worry, however, is that other countries won't feel bound by these rules, uh, particularly if having invented the technology, and will be quite happy to follow uh, different rules and we'll have two different standards. The next thing is we're going to make the mistake that we made with cyber, which is that you know the technology is out there, uh, fast connectivity, accessibility, convenience apps, and then 10 years later on, we're going to think, oh, bugger, security. What about security? Nobody thought of security. Uh, and we have to try to retrofit it into the whole system very painfully, very expensively later on. You know, it's like if you buy a car without the brakes. Oh, damn it, forgot the brakes. And then you know, have to sort of 
try to fit them. So uh, the, the, the real issue is that these technologies are emerging much faster than our ability really to handle the public policy uh, implications. And as you rightly said, the real revolution is that they're coming out of the private sector. You know, for example, yeah. if you look at the United States, uh, not just under Trump, this has been going on for a while. The amount of money that the United States is investing in R&D has gone down very, very, very significantly. But this is compensated by the, by the enormous sums that you know, Google, Facebook, the tech companies uh, are investing. You know, Verizon, the US telecoms company, now has more data on every American citizen than the National Security Agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're quite right. The real issue of the future is, is that can we persuade these tech companies, which are actually going to control security in the 21st century, because he who controls data, as Putin has said, Putin said, and I agree with him on this one, he who uh, dominates artificial intelligence will rule the world. And he's absolutely right. Can we persuade those private sector companies, you know, not just to sort of work with us to develop the military applications, but above all, to sort of you know have with governments a kind of pact of social responsibility to start looking at some of the implications of this debate. Not like Facebook, you know, pulled kicking and screaming, you know, in front of Congress when it was you know caught out for fake news and algorithms and you know uh, uh, you know Google search engines taking you only to their preferred sites. But but right at the very beginning, you know, because uh, uh, for example, Google. But the has, beginning is over. Google already. has refused to work on artificial intelligence of the United States. They refuse to work for the Project Maven of the Pentagon. Okay, you could say this is a fine move, you know, for not getting into bed with governments. But in China and Russia, all of the companies are state companies that work. And, and whereas, you know, it used to be the case that people who work for governments would go to work for tech companies, now it's got to be the other way around. Tech companies have got to spend much more of their wealth rich Americans and others have got to spend a much, much more of their wealth helping the government to deal with the implications of all of this uh, and, and the public policy debate. You know, whether you like it or not, you know, at least when Microsoft came up with this idea of a, of a digital con Geneva Convention in the era of cyber, at least it's an indication that they're starting to realise that they've got a greater responsibility than simply to make money. Uh, uh, but it's going to be the private sector, uh, not governments, that are going to drive all this. But aren't you also working on building norms in some of the organizations that you're working for? Um, well, uh, sorry, were you talking? Yes. Well, no, I, I mean, I don't work for the EU or for a government, so I'm not necessarily building norms. May I, may I add to like two, two points, uh, or probably three, uh, add to, to what Jamie said, and I, these are excellent remarks. First one, I think, let's be clear, right? AI is not a capability, right? It's an enabler, and people have famously said AI can better be, shouldn't be likened to a tank, but it's better to liken it to uh, electricity or fuel, right? And that's a really important kind of conceptualization. And the other one is that when we talk about AI and the future of AI, we have seen what we would now define as AI, like intelligence system or intelligent-like systems, already from the late 19th century, where you would even see torpedoes uh, having some kind of um, callback function when it comes to its, its, its its stability and so on. So it's, it's in, in, in some ways, it's not necessarily a new thing. It's, it's, it's a gradual development. And, and as Jamie also said, and I think that's a really essential one, it's not necessarily the killer robots. It's not the concepts that we hear in the news around swarming, where we have our killer robots on land, where we have our drones in the air, which, which behave like birds all at once attacking an adversary, where we'll see the biggest implications and implementation of AI technology. Instead, it is really in the logistical sphere, right? And that's where we already see it today, where Project Maven in the US uh, against uh, counterinsurgencies, now particularly in Syria, is is the most prominent one, but you can even think of other technology, right? We know that the EU satellite uh, project there is already able to very well identify ships. Um, humans don't need to do this anymore on kind of what kind of ships they, those are. It are those type of technologies, and in that sphere where we will see it, less in the fancy stuff that is put in our face and like through, I don't know, in like all the, um, all the videos, but more in the kind of perhaps boring logistics. And, and with that, we can take stock of where we will go with with warfare, like, again, to the big companies such as Amazon and, and so on, where Amazon 
its implementation of AI is not necessarily in the drone that delivers it your package, but the really competitive advantage that they have is in the algorithms that help in the distribution center to already send a package to a certain area, even though you haven't even ordered it. But they know based on their algorithms that it's more likely that given a certain trend, uh, people will, will uh, order packages, uh, I don't know, in, uh, in Amsterdam today, and so we already shipped them uh, yesterday to this area. Now, those kind of technologies that we see there, that we will also see in similar logistical ways um, in the in the military uh, sphere. And as it is an enabler, and this is where I think we'll see the biggest, um, it will take the most time to really implement, it will be enabled like already often conventional technologies and alongside it, right? Or conventional military operations and military planning and military tools. And that's where we'll see the challenges as well, because that will require institutional backing, that will require human capital, and that's where we'll see unevenness across different countries as well, where we'll see a US who might maybe be a first mover in that space, and other countries are lacking behind. And when we then think about the theme around NATO and its relevance, it's really there where there is a huge challenge, like how how can you then make sure that you have true interoperability between um, these different, um, different countries um, when it comes to the use of that technology um, throughout their whole operations? I think you know, there's a point about compression because you know, if you take, for example, the big game changers of previous centuries, you know, uh, things like the invention of the airplane, the invention of the motor car, for example, uh, we had decades and decades from the first prototype, the first car in the 1880s, uh, until the first safe car, which was invented in the late 1960s. So it took you know, virtually 70 years for this technology to mature, you know, safe aircraft and, and all of the regulatory things around the International Civil Aviation Agency and all of that. So these technologies matured, if you like, and impacted our lives over a long period of time. There was plenty of time you know, to get to grips with the public policy issues, to make mistakes, to correct them. Uh, the iPhone is 12 years old. Facebook, I think, is 15 uh, years old. You know, these things have transformed our lives uh, you know, within pretty much a decade. And it's just taken you know, 12 years in, in the case of Google or, or, or Apple and the iPhone you know, to go from the invention of the technology to the massive debate about the public policy uh, I implications. You know? So we just don't have this sort of luxury as we had with previous technologies of this long rollout period. You know, for example, the United mm -hmm. States took a century to emerge as a major power. China's done it in 25 years. Uh, 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 you know, growing, uh, the Chinese economy has quintupled since 2003. It, it's incredible, but it's absolutely true. So we're dealing now with speed that as human beings we're simply not accustomed to. Uh, and you know, like with climate change, in all of these issues, there's a tipping point below which you have options, you can do something, you have agency, and beyond which you lose control uh, entirely. Uh, the longer you wait, the worse and the fewer your options uh, become. Uh, and I think that's true of this tech uh, as well. Uh, and uh, that's my big worry, uh, the, you know, the public policy debate waits for you know, the worst side to come out, but by then it's too late to really deal with it effectively. We need to get you know, into the curve much quicker this time around. Okay, I think we should now open the questions up to our audience. I'm sure there are people out there that have questions, right? And maybe I could ask Sarah to help me with this. People have questions? I can't see, actually. Hi, um, for Jamie, um, in, in the very beginning of your introduction, you spoke of the four plus two uh, domains of uh, attackability, you could say, or defense. But then later on, you, you did include the economy as a factor. Of course, countries fight each other with sanctions. Uh, we see it all over the place. Is that not a, a, a means of retaliation and, and perhaps even preemptive striking? the economy as seventh domain, financial or otherwise? Uh, the, thank you, that, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, when I spoke about the, uh, the, the, the sort of five or six domains uh, uh, that NATO uses, it's where obviously military uh, organizations are, are active, or at least in the information sphere, don't have a monopoly, but at least are trying to play a, a, a role. But what we do see these days, yes, you're absolutely right, is the increased use of sanctions as a sort of form of coercion, of persuasion, 
which is an alternative to uh, uh, military uh, uh, power. Um, uh, we want, uh, and and uh, we have, for example, probably more sanctions regimes in the world today uh, than we've uh, ever known before. Uh, certainly, uh, that is important in the way that we're going back to technology transfer and technology control. Uh, you, you had here in the Netherlands during the Cold War at Vassenaar, just outside The Hague, uh, an organisation uh, which uh, looked at you know, the transfer of technology to the Warsaw Pact, the communist countries, you know, the critical list, the, you know, the high-speed computers, the special materials and so on, the, the guidance systems. You, the, you couldn't necessarily always stop communist countries getting this technology, but at least you wanted to make it harder for them and slowing down. In many respects, uh, we, I think we're in a world where we're going back to that kind of thing. Maybe not the Vassenaar Agreement as such, but for example, in the United States, the Pentagon is now looking with major American companies about you know, what's your exposure to China? What are you exporting? What are you giving them? Are you helping them to, make, you know, to obtain microprocessors? Uh, you know, if we've got new technology, which other people can exploit against us. You know, what can we do to uh, keep them out of their hands? Uh, there's even talk of, for example, the internet splitting up into different forms of uh, in internet as well. And the end of globalization in terms of economies now sort of delinking themselves from the global economy and going back to a version of autarky. For the EU as a trading uh, block, you know, 40% of Germany's uh, 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 overall trade is, is, is exports. This is not particularly uh, good news. Uh, so you could argue, yes, that this kind of economic competition is better than war, obviously military uh, uh, competition. Uh, but you see in the case of Iran, uh, which is sort of lashed out now in the Middle East, that you know, when you sort of strangle uh, a country you know, with the oil embargo and so on, it, it could potentially lash out in military ways because it feels it's the only way of sort of uh, grabbing uh, attention as, uh, as well. So no, I wouldn't say that the economic competition is a domain of military warfare, but it's certainly a, 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 an increasingly important competition, a, a factor of, the, uh, of this global competition. The problem is, is that a few years ago, globalization was win-win. You remember that? Win-win. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats, uh, you know, China gets lifted, 300 million Chinese are lifted out of poverty, but it's good because cheap Chinese goods uh, come onto the Western market, so everybody benefits. Uh, some more than others, but everybody benefits. Now we're in basically win-lose, if you know, zero-sum game. If I win, then you must be losing, uh, you know, particularly with tariffs and sanctions and all that. The real danger is that this is going to take us into a lose-lose where everybody ends up uh, losing. But somebody will think they're the winner. Do you want to know why they think they're the winner? Because they'll be losing slightly more slowly than you will be uh, losing. Uh, but I don't think that's the outcome that, 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 that we want. So can we go back to win-win like we seem to have just a decade or so ago? I don't know. But, but sanctions now are, are, have become the major instrument of coercive diplomacy. OK, thank you. Other questions? So over here, we have some. Hi, my name is Charlotte. Um, I'm still a student. And, um, Lucky as, you. <laughs> as you were talking in your final remarks about that tipping point we're waiting for, I was at the same po point I was writing something down about it. Because for me, listening to all of this, it really seems that um, like, even though we have a lot of governments and states and opinions about uh, whether it's in cyber attack or an act of cyber warfare or whatever, we have a, a lot of different opinions. Uh, we all agree on the same problems, that we have these problems and we all talk about it and talk about it, but no one really seems to come up with like a real solution for it. And I was thinking about it, is that because states or governments are scared to take the, lead, the leading role in coming up with uh, like a solution or an, even a suggestion or whatever? Um, and I was thinking like, what can NATO do to maybe take up uh, on this leading role? Can we push this? Uh, a collaboration of states to take a leading role in the world, uh, to show an example to other states, like, look, uh, we're coming up with um, yeah, solutions and this is what we're going to do. And even be a bit shocking maybe about, you know, what solutions could be. Like, the more shocking, the more it will be in someone's face, I guess, and they'll be like, oh, well, maybe we should come up with something else. And I don't know, I was just, think I was just thinking about it, but maybe a question to you all, um, yeah. 
It, it, it's a really good question. I, I, I answered the last question, so I feel a bit egocentric taking the floor, but you mentioned NATO. I just wanted to say no hysteria. I mean, I should have made the point, uh, but you know, there's a, a, a mate of mine in Brussels, Sven Biskop, who is a very smart an analyst, and he says, you know, hybrid hysteria. And he's right. You know, remember during the communist days, we used to say, reds under the beds. You know, we saw threats everywhere, and we frightened ourselves more than the Soviet Union frightened us. And we mustn't indulge in hybrid hysteria. As I've said, you know, the competitive world means that these problems can't, are not going to go away, but they can be effectively managed. Um, again, I spend a lot of time on trains, uh, and that's when I do my reading. I was, I was reading a financial report from the London banking sector coming on cyber, coming back on the train from London on Monday, and it said, you know, that the banking sector had reported a sharp drop of, of cyber a, 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 a attacks, or at least breaches, uh, and it wasn't because the threat had gone away, but, you know, they're learning. You know, they're, 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 they're wised up now. You know, this has been around now for a while. They've seen the implications, financial damage, reputation damage. The government has been prodding them along. They're getting help from the government. So, you know, they're dealing with it. They're, they're bringing it to, you know, like with the flu outbreak, they're bringing it to a management sort of proportion. On terrorism, you know, we, we've had a, in Europe major problems, but we've learned the lessons, you know, more border checks, ID checks, more international cooperation, common arrest warrant. You know, we could go on and on and on. Cities have started thinking about protecting streets with both, whatever, you know, we've wised up. We realise that, you know, we're not defenceless. Uh, we do have options. We can make it uh, harder uh, and, and, and so on. You know, the hardening of critical infrastructure, looking at European energy networks, connecting people so that if your power supply you know, falls down there. You've got now a connector so you can get power supplies there. The EU's done a lot of work on it. So I'm not arguing that we should all go home tonight thinking, oh my God, hybrid, you know, uh, like a, you know, a Hollywood blockbuster horror movie that we're defenseless. We're, we're, we're certainly not. I mentioned the EU now with a China strategy, which doesn't say we don't want to cooperate with China, but which is more, you know, sort of uh, honest. Uh, uh, and open-eyed about what the risks are and how to manage these risks. You know, it's all about risk management uh, and, you know, no knowing how to assess risk properly and knowing how to devote resources according to where the greater risks are. I mean, you know, I, I was on the beach during the summer and I was wearing my Speedo shorts, which is a, another <laughs> Hollywood blockbuster, uh, and I had to cho I'd only had the shorts, so I had to choose which part of the body I wanted my Speedo swimming trunks to cover. You get the analogy? I couldn't put them everywhere. I don't have enough resources to get... So risk management is all about, you know, you know where do you, how do you assess risk and how do you allocate resources so you deal with the most urgent uh, 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 risks in the most rational security policy. That's what insurance companies do every day, and that's what you know, the security policy community is learning to do as well. Rita, you wanted to say something? Well, I, I just wanted to sort of come back to a few questions of who has agency, because you said, you know, we assume that states are not powerful, etc. I think states are very powerful. Uh, and I, I think it really brings it back to the question of what kind of governance do we choose? So if a state, look at China, decides, the political uh, leaders decide, Artificial intelligence is going to be the direction we're going to take. We would like the companies, the researchers, everybody to come on board, and there's not that much uh, distinction between private companies and the state. Then I think we have to ask ourselves, knowing what we know about changing relations of power in the world, you know, do we trust that we are going to be the standard setters in this space, or do we think that if we identify a technology that is, that is expected to really benefit from centralized governance, you know, because there can be, uh, there can be use of more data to advance the technology, uh, you know, which in turn will empower uh, that state, then the question is, where does it put us? So when, when Jamie asks how much risk are we willing to take, uh, I think that that's, that's a very important question to ask with regard to this technology. Because when I talk to computer engineers that are working on machine learning and artificial intelligence, the thing that they are most excited about is the idea that the algorithm or the program or whatever they've coded, the pattern recognition or, or the, the uh, process, will actually come up with something that nobody expected. So the excitement and the expectation lies in unexpected outcomes. So I think it helps to think about what is the intended outcome. So for example, a drone is built to you know, be more precise in targeting a person or whatever. It's an intended uh, outcome of the technology, but there is also unintended outcomes sometimes. And a lot of the, the questions that we have to answer is, 
what, go what are we going to do with governance? What are we going to accept to bleed into the private sector? You know, do we think it's acceptable that private companies are now developing the kinds of weapons, uh, also tech-enabled uh, weapons, that are more powerful than the ones that states have, or that put the states in, the, in a dependent position vis-a-vis uh, -vis these technologies? If we think it's an advantage to have drones that can kill people autonomously, what do we think if a Chinese drone attacks a human rights defender uh, very targeted, no collateral damage, one person, cartoonist, down uh, in the streets of Berlin. What is that? You know, where does it put us? So I think we have to look at the question of how powerful are states, what kind of governance do we see, where does it put us, alliance of, of uh, NATO countries, alliance of European countries, in this context, vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the shrinking uh, space for democracies globally. I mean, it's not like the world is becoming uh, fuller of democratic countries. And so I think the question is, who has agency? How fast can we respond? But also, what are the principles that we want to preserve? We don't have to come up with new solutions for all the new technologies. We can simply say, there is a presumption of innocence. We're not going to allow an AI model to decide whether you are going to stay in prison or going to leave the prison early. Uh, we're not going to allow discrimination. Uh, on the basis of skin color, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and whatnot. So I think we have to sort of start with the principles that we know very well in the rule of law and, and democracy, build on that, and make sure that they apply no matter whether it's AI or another technology disrupting the models that we know in terms of technology. You want to add something, Max? Yeah, it, back to the question on, on specifically, have we seen any changes in policy when it comes to facing cyber threats and, and whether NATO can take the lead or a country can take the lead and why they're not kind of innovative in their ideas? Actually, what we have witnessed in the past year from the US government is the most significant change in cyber policy that we've ever witnessed before. And that should be recognized, right? So the US Cyber Command put out, put out a vision where they talked about persistent engagement and the defense, uh, uh, Department of Defense um, put out a new strategy around Defend Forward. That's a huge change, both in the way they look at cyberspace as well as the policies that they seek to implement uh, in, in, in the future. So whereas before, they were indeed very much focused on these big attacks, they're now saying, hey, we see this much broader space of activity. We see si like Chinese espionage operations that, that are like broadly and cumulatively can have great strategic effects on our domain. They might not be immediately military. Um, we need to do something about that. We see Russian disinformation operations um, that again are below the trash of the bomb attack, but we really need to, to address that too. That's a, that's a big change, but they also say we need to move away from deterrence, we need to move towards persistent engagement. Constantly engaging with the adversary where we want to maneuver wherever they go. Now that's a big change. Um, and the question here then is, one, if that's supposedly an innovative approach, okay, one, will it work? Will it be escalatory? What does that mean for the alliance? What does it mean if, if, uh, if for instance, the US government if, uh, wants to maneuver where adversaries maneuver and it happens to be in a European network? What does that mean? Uh, should the US government come in to potentially disrupt the server? All those things. So that's one, but it's also a second one. It really then pushes the question to a lot of European countries, like, hey, so what is your strategy? Are we just leaving that, and particularly uh, to, to just, is this just a diplomatic question? Should just be one of like more public attribution, more regulation? Is there a role of the military in the same way as the US is currently implementing, or do we have a different approach? And why, what are the resources? And that's a real debate that is going on right now. So we have seen a country moving in a very different direction, and it's really now up to Europe, and particularly, you could say, like, yeah, Europe more generally, uh, on, on how they will respond. And then there is an open question on what that means for the NATO alliance. It's a good point, this, because uh, I, I also feel that one of the big problems in the, with the speed of development, as you rightly say, is that you get a situation in NATO where you know, half of the allies have invested in these, in these capabilities, and it's the US, but you know, you've got the UK, which uh, the Netherlands, you know, others which are publicly, uh, France, have said that they are developing an offensive cyber capability, not offensive in terms of attacking people, but to respond to what they feel are attacks on themselves. Uh, that, that's key. Uh, they may not describe the details, but it's clear that, you know, that they can do things if they need to do them. And then other NATO countries who haven't invested, 
all, uh, are way behind the curve, and basically feel very uncomfortable with this brave new world. You know, the old NATO, everybody owned tanks, so collective defense was easy when everybody had the same capabilities and the same notion of how they were going to be used. But if you get a kind of two-tier or two-class kind of system, as I say, with some comfortable with you know, thought through the rules of engagement, the legal aspects, others who, oh, you know, we're not so sure, uh, then it's not going to be easy uh, because, uh, you know, when, when you get to cyber, NATO itself is not going to try to own uh, these things. It said we're going to rely upon what nations are willing to uh, provide. Uh, and therefore, if you, you know, get into a situation where NATO has to trust individual allies to do things on behalf of the alliance, but without knowing what they're actually doing, because those countries that are doing it are not going to say so, <laughs> uh, you know, then well, yeah. you know, how do you establish that kind of basis of confidence um, that you know, you're willing to sort of go along with that? Because you know, if you send a tank division somewhere, it's totally transparent. It's on CNN. Everybody can see what's happening. Everybody can own, if you like, ownership of it. And but if, you if you're dealing with these that, you're cover, not tell anybody. what we call the war in the shadows, you know, the cover kind of operations where you know, people are doing things on your behalf under your responsibility, but you don't really know about it. That's not going to be easy. And I think this is going to be, you know, this well, digital divide. Things. Digital divide is going to be one of the big issues that we're going to have to confront. Yeah, but also the other thing about you can't see it. I mean, can Parliament see it if, if there is sort of a permanent operational status? in this whole digital domain, which is offensive, but maybe not sort of aggressive in terms of t making the first step, then the question is, you know, if it's invisible to us, <laughs> uh, probably, is it invisible to parliaments? What is the threshold? Who is making these technologies, private companies? We all know that when once a technology is is available, it often proliferates, so it ends up in places where it was never intended to be. This has been recognized at the highest level uh, of, of national security in the United States as well, that a, a government, law enforcement, army, whoever, special cyber unit may put a procurement um, task into the market, get the technology, and then the technology may you know, end up in, in 20 different places used against the interest it was supposed to defend. So this, this question of invisibility is not just a technical question of, oh, you know, new ways, we don't know how they work. It also have, has big implications on oversight and who is ultimately responsible and whether you can have any kind of accountability in this space, which I think if your democracy is, is vital, this rule of law principle of oversight over power. There was another question here. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is James, I'm from London University. Uh, just down the road. I want to ask about the relevance of sort of professions and expert ethics in this, right? We understand that it's a multipolar world, that the EU or NATO or US is not going to be the only value setter in the future, right? And China, um, the global south, African nations will have their voice, they will have their own normative views. So what is the role for saying, trying to say, here's what scientists should behave, should do, here's how they should behave ethically. Maybe here's what journalists should do, wherever they are in the world. Right? So there's a role for pro professional ethics if you're in artificial intelligence, if you're in journalism, um, if you're sort of developing you know, cyber technologies, if you're a professional uh, cyber security um, expert, then how can you instill ethics that cross these boundaries and w what should NATO be doing in terms of that? Should it be doing anything? Ethics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, I think there's a lot of uh, nonsense. I'm trying to be diplomatic in the whole discussion about ethics, as though it was a solution for every question of of choosing a values path. I mean, Jamie said, you know, said something about whether companies are going to sort of help advance governments, let's say democratic ones for the moment, or or vice versa. You have to know what you're talking about. And I would encourage you to read um, the Chinese Council of Ethics recommendations to the governments on ethics for AI. You know, if you're not really close reading, you will not hear much of a difference between those sets of principles and the sets of principles that a number of companies, a number of coalitions, a number of expert councils have put forward. You know, it should be human-centric. It should be, uh, you know, uh, transparent. It should be, I mean, all kinds of, like, nice words, but it really, in my opinion, comes down to what happens when those 
principles are not respected. And if it's only about ethics, and if we're just going to talk about it a little bit more, then it never really um, anchors, I think, behavior. And uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't really know what you what you were looking for in terms of you know, like academic ethics or, or something like that. I always think that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a very helpful starting point when it comes to, you know, understanding your relation to people everywhere in the world, you know, not to, not to violate those. Uh, but of course, governments make it impossible to, uh, to live according to those in, in many places. So I don't think I understood 100% that part of your question. Uh, but understanding the global context, also when we make a decision here, understanding what implications it can have in a much less free society, I think it's vital. And this, this ethics could really be a trap uh, in that context too. Okay, we have, I see more questions after we're running out of time, but um, look to Sarah to see how much time we have. I'm, okay. I'm just curious about um, the underlying assumptions about uh, free society um, outside of NATO um, in this discussion, because I've heard a lot of reference to China, which is referred to as a threat, but there's been a global critique of the West, of NATO, of the, I guess, the sponsor tonight. And I'm wondering how that impacts your um, thinking about the different options, ethic, not just ethical, but philosophical and maybe moral on the table. Sorry, maybe you can first, uh, they can first answer the questions and then... Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, just just on, on, on the ethics thing very briefly, I know it was the previous question, but uh, uh, you, uh, what Mauritius says is right, when you go to the UN, you, know, you hear this very vague language, win-win uh, cooperation, community of shared, future for mankind, democratization of international relations. It all sounds very great. You know, yeah. Who could disagree with that? It's all vague. Uh, and the, the vagueness is meant to water down anything concrete, anything specific. Uh, uh, and that won't do uh, because it allows everybody then to interpret that in, in its own way. So we, like with any treaty, any legal agreement, we need very precise language. And I totally agree with you. If it's not enforceable, it's not going to work. We have this uh, thing that the Council of Europe invented on cybercrime called the, uh, the Budapest Convention. Over 60 countries have signed up. It's a wonderful set of rules. But if there's no enforcement mechanism, you know, no incentive to uh, do well, no uh, uh, sanctions if you don't do well, then uh, it, it's, it's not going to work. Um, so you're right, we do need an ethical code, but it's got to be something that comes with associated uh, uh, measures, uh, uh, otherwise it will be meaningless. Uh, the question there, uh, I think, is a good one. Uh, you know, China is not an enemy. Uh, what we have, what, like most countries of the world, is what the Americans call frenemies. Sometimes they're your friends, sometimes they're not. You know, it depends on the day of the week, it depends on the issues. They have interests. They're complicated, and you can't boil them down to one stereotypical image of nice or not nice. You know, with all our countries, the big countries of the world, even the ones that are our allies, we need to follow a policy of three C's, I think, in Europe. Confront, and I don't mean that militarily, but sometimes you have to push back. Yeah, uh, even your friends can behave re unreasonably or, or break the law or whatever. And, and confrontation is sometimes necessary. You have to be robust. You have to push back. Uh, you have to contain. Yes, yeah, so if you can't stop them doing silly things, you at least have to try to avoid the repercussions that are going to hurt you. And of course, where and when you can cooperate, you, you can. You know, uh, the United States uh, had a, a very difficult relationship with the Soviet Union and they were threatening each other for, with nuclear weapons, but that didn't stop them cooperating, even during the Cold War, a whole host of, of different things. So, you know, this is the way which we go, the three C's, and wise policy knows when to confront, when to contain, and when to uh, uh, cooperate. I don't believe that it's wise to demonize China. Uh, for example, the director of policy planning in the State Department in the United States, uh, Kieran Skinner, has made herself rather famous by you know, declaring that China is the uh, first non-Caucasian 
enemy, adversary that the United States is up against, that this is a clash of civilizations. People like Frank Gaffney and others you may have heard of in the United States have re resurrected the Committee on the Present Danger, which existed in the 1980s to you know, deal with the, you know, the, the Soviet Union as a greater threat, this time vis-a-vis -vis China. I, I, I don't agree with this. I think you know, putting China up as the kind of you know, the systemic adversary only will play into the hands of the uh, uh, Chinese. Uh, and will prevent cooperation. Uh, I think the EU approach, which is, you know, these guys are a reality, but we need to cooperate, but let's not be starry-eyed about it. Let's defend our interests. You know, let's make it clear to them that we're united and that we can be tough negotiators just like them, I, I think is the, uh, is, the, is the right way to uh, go. So I just but answer my just mouse for there. Briefly adding one anecdote from actually a former colleague of mine, Amy Siegert, who was teaching two classes, one to, to the defense people at the National Defense University and the other one at, at Stanford uh, teaching uh, a class to the business students. And, and to both, she actually, in the case of China, uh, although I realize this question might be slightly broader, was asking um, the same question, like, what is China dot, dot, dot? And like what people would fill in was like a huge difference, right? So you had all the, diff uh, the, the, the business people saying, it's a market, it's uh, an opportunity, it's mm -hmm. all of that. And then you had all the defense people, uh, of course, saying it's a competitor, it's an adversary, it's a threat. And the divide that I think we see today, particularly in the US, between, between DC and Silicon Valley is, is huge. And the way that it is perceived and the interaction that, that plays out and how that is gonna be managed, particularly in such a kind of interdependent uh, world. I think, I think you asked something about criticism of NATO itself. But I was thinking of how NATO overlaps with former colonial countries, and that is the source of the critique of NATO in, in most of the countries that have been kind of named as other or outside of a kind of value system. But, you know, when you really think about um, the... The last 10 years especially, there's been a huge delegitimization de of the West, which you uh, noted, not on the lines of the former Cold War, but much earlier. And we're back to a kind of situation where we had, yeah, big companies like the VOC or the Hudson's Bay Company, still on Rokin, um, you know, um, probably vying for um, control with nation states, which didn't quite exist when those companies were founded in the way that they do now. So I was more thinking of the way the conversation has been structured has not at all looked at what the critique of, I guess, colonialism, most broadly speaking, could be um, uh, said to have done to the idea of NATO. I mean, the, when we talk about, you know, is, is NATO under attack? I think to say that it's under attack from China, it's also under attack morally from the former colonies because it is actually overlapping with colonial states, right? A lot of it. I think maybe that should be a different, more in-depth discussion because it's, uh, it, I mean, it's, a, I think, a very different uh, angle than the whole tech mm -hmm. uh, angle. But I, I think, generally speaking, it's no secret that there is a lot of pressure on, on NATO in general, look at the president in the United States who, you know, there is quite a few speculations about where he's gonna go, look at the country of Turkey and how, you know, reliable it is. Obviously, you know, lots of chapters in our past that are, that are very, very dirty that we all have to uh, reckon with and that should also, um, well, be a continual discussion, I, I think, about where we want to be today and how we can be more responsible actors. But I think, you know, there, I, I've never seen a country that's like without mistakes in its past. I also think that uh, morality and, and understanding of, of what, is, what is just and what is the right path changes over time. Um, and we should always aspire to higher principles. And that's why it's, it's important that whatever we do to defend ourselves, whether it's in NATO context or, or elsewhere, is making those principles more, more robust. Uh, that's what I was trying to 
trying to hint at when I was talking about disinformation, when I was talking about oversight over private companies that are, that are asked to facilitate some of these tools that are used in, in conflict situations, and similarly to deploy you know, whichever forces, whether it's uh, virtual or otherwise, in a, in a context of conflict and war, I believe democracies are different because they have oversight over those decisions instead of you know, just one person uh, deciding for, for everyone else. So. I'm, I'm sure this is not an answer to the depth of your question, but I don't think we can cover, I mean, I don't think I'm capable of covering that right now. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point, a fair point, but you know, my, my sense is, again, we have to look at the complete picture, which inevitably is complicated and multi-sided. Uh, there are many allies uh, today who were in fact colonized uh, for decades, uh, not necessarily by uh, France or the United Kingdom, but by Russia, for example, the Baltic states who had their independence taken away, uh, Poland, you know, carved up uh, uh, and occupied, uh, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, countries lo lo lost territory, or were part of other states, Slovenia, Croatia, where they weren't particularly happy, a different form of colonialization. So many allies are victims in their view, of a form of colonization, uh, and not just uh, uh, perpetrators of, of that. So it's a, a mixed bag. Uh, I would say today, though, just two things, because Marich is right. I mean, this is a big debate, and we would need a, another uh, session. We'd have to wind the clock back to 8 o'clock and start again uh, to do it justice. But uh, you know, today, NATO uh, has partnerships with a number of countries in Africa. We have a very good relationship with the African Union, supporting development of the African Union's peacekeeping capabilities. We have a dialogue with many Arab states and so on in the, uh, in, in, in the Gulf of, uh, as well. Partnerships with, in fact, uh, uh, a good sort of 25, 26 odd countries. So you know, whatever the past is, it hasn't prevented, I think, the current generation of leaders in seeing the virtues of cooperation. And if you take all of the NATO countries together in terms of contribution to the United Nations, the development funds, you know, uh, disaster relief in the wake of hurricanes and, and all that. you don't really see very many Russian ch troops maybe tomorrow who knows Chinese troops you know rushing off to the Bahamas or other places in the wake of, uh, of hurricanes so you're right we've got a difficult legacy and there's no sense in denying that but that doesn't necessarily mean that we are prevented from building new relationships now I'm I think we have start. to wrap up, yes, but we have, we have a third round at the bar, so you can yes, ask your questions. Yes, we can ask more questions, questions at the bar. There. I had one on hypersonic warfare, so we'll, we can leave that for the next time. So I think we could give our panelists a big round of applause. <laughs> yes. And we continue in the bar. <laughs> Thank you.